So uh, as you can see, um, we have had our, our share of challenges. And I wanted to talk to, uh, to our panel here a little bit about how much of this is just talk and how much of it is actually something we should worry about. And I'm going to start uh, with that question with uh, Ashley Messenger. So how much of, of what is being said just uh, sound and fury and how much do you and other media attorneys actually worry about some of this? Um, so I just want to start off by saying that I am not omniscient. I don't know for sure. <laughs> um, A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of what politicians do is express their viewpoints and they criticize the media when they don't like what they see or hear. That's not new. That's been going on my entire life, probably before I was born. Um, I'm not particularly phased by politicians criticizing the media. It's just part of what they do. What worries me more are specific actions that are taken to try to affect journalists or to impair press freedom. That is more worrisome to me. But we haven't seen a lot of that aside from the arrests. Uh, there have been some recent arrests. There, there were some arrests at the protest after the election. There were the, the arrest of the reporter in West Virginia recently. I have looked for footage of what actually happened that day because I'd like to see if the reporter did do something wrong. He was accused of trying to breach Secret Service. There's no footage of that. There is footage, however, of him being uh, walked away by police officers after he was detained. He was very calm. He wasn't struggling or fighting. Uh, the reporter is a well-known, well-established reporter. He's been around for a long time. Uh, the accounts of the incident that I've seen say that he was simply asking questions. And he was, as many reporters do, leaning forward to try to get attention. I don't think that counts as breaching Secret Service. But the facts are not all out yet. We'll have to wait and see. But if it's true, if it, if it is in fact true that all he was doing was asking a question and he was detained for that reason, I would consider that extremely troublesome. Um, that is very contrary to everything that the First Amendment stands for. It's contrary to basic principles of civil society. I just don't, and it certainly doesn't uh, rise to the level of, what was the charge again? Interfering with government process? Uh, willful disruption. Willful, yeah. willful disruption of government process. Uh, there was no government proceeding happening. People were literally standing in the hallway. So I find it hard to believe that that's a valid charge. But we will have to wait to see what happens. And I, I wanted to add, you're in, in kind of a unique position uh, in that you work for uh, a publicly uh, supported uh, media outlet, uh, National Public Radio, is part of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which includes both NPR and PBS. Uh, in his budget proposal, uh, President Trump had proposed ending all funding for uh, public media. Uh, could you, perhaps for folks here who aren't from the United States, could you talk a little bit about how public media works in the United States and how it differs perhaps from other parts of the world? Sure. Um so our system's a little complicated for public media. Most media in the United States is commercial. It's, it's funded through advertising. So if you're CNN or the New York Times or whatever commercial publication, you get ad revenue and that supports your operations and that's how you function. And most media is commercial. But that doesn't work in all parts of the United States. We have, um, it's, it's a big country and there's, um, a lot of land and there are large portions in the United States where commercial media is not viable because you might have you know maybe 5,000 people and you can't run ad supported media for 5,000 people that you could never get enough ad dollars to do that um, and people aren't going to advertise to uh, people aren't going to pay to advertise to cows cows don't buy stuff <laughs> so if you're in a rural area with a lot of dairy farms you don't have many options for commercial media especially commercial broadcast and broadcast, terrestrial um, analog broadcast is the cheapest, cheapest, easiest way to send signals across a wide territory. So if there's an emergency like a tornado or some other emergency and you need to get news and information to people, there needs to be an easy way to do that. And so in the 1960s, Congress created the Public Broadcasting Act, which allows for um, an, an appropriation of money that goes to what's called the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And Corporation for Public Broadcasting is not a government agency, it's a private entity. And that entity then makes disbursements to individual stations on a need-based need basis so that they can 
get towers and send signals out because if they need to get news and information to people in remote areas, that is the easiest way to do it. The other nice thing about terrestrial radio is that you can pick up airwaves without any technology. You don't need electricity. So if the power goes out, you can literally use a hand crank radio to pick up the signals. So it's a really important tool for everything from national security to health and safety for all kinds of reasons. And it is a way to solve a problem that the, the market can't solve. It's just not commercially viable to have commercial radio in, in parts of the country. So uh, there is some funding from Congress to CPB, and CPB then can make appropriations to stations. However, most of the funding comes from private donations, listener donations, there's commercial sponsorship, uh, which is not the same thing as advertising, it's sponsorship, and the FCC has rules about what those messages can sound like. They can't have, mention prices, they can't invite people to buy their goods or services, they simply say, you know, this program is brought to you by Ford maker of the Ford Focus, that's it. It's, they're very Usually simple website. messages. Hmm? Usually website though. Uh, and on the website, it, we can have messages on there too. So, uh, so, so the question, oh, so the proposed budget would eliminate all monies to CPB, which would take away all appropriations for radio. Um, and that would mean that stations who need funding in order to simply operate might not get it. And they may, they probably won't be able to make up for it with listener donations because they're in rural areas, you don't have as many people, they're just not gonna be able to compensate. So it would really be terrible for the public radio system if that happened. Um, we certainly hope it doesn't happen. But the president's proposed budget is not necessarily the budget. Um, in our, in the United States system, Congress actually appropriates the money and Congress will have to decide what the budget's gonna look like. So that hasn't happened yet. We don't know what's gonna happen, but we certainly hope that Congress chooses to continue to support this very important service that we provide um, in parts of the country that otherwise wouldn't have access to commercial media. Thank you, Andrew. Daoud, I wanted to ask you a little bit because you've, worked, you've lived and worked in both the United States and, and Jordan uh, and other parts of the world too. Um, when People, t because I'm sure many people know that you lived in the United States for a while, I'm sure you get asked a lot, what, what is actually going on? Um, isn't the United States supposed to be a beacon of freedom or whatever? What, what kind of uh, dialogue have you been having with people in, in Jordan and elsewhere about what is currently going on in the United States? Well, initially before that, um, I, I do um, um, set up and, and um, help create local media, including lots of local radio stations. And uh, we do a lot of training in, in issues of ethics and uh, professionalism. And the issue of the First Amendment is a huge part of our training uh, program because we feel it's a very powerful instrument that uh, we hope could be emulated in developing countries, in countries with autocratic uh, regimes, that to understand that there is a law above the day-to-day -day law and the constitutional uh, amendment that prevents politicians from playing around with the freedom of expression because most countries including Jordan have a in the Constitution says uh, freedom of expression is guaranteed in accordance to law and when you put that in accordance to law addition you basically uh, weaken the freedom of expression is guaranteed because basically it puts the power in the hands of, of, of legislators who change every now and then and who are often under the influence of governments. So uh, what is important about the First Amendment in our eyes in the way we, we try to use it to, um, to train people and to explain to people and as, as well as the legislators is that freedom of expression should be guaranteed, period. The moment you add that in accordance to law, you basically negate the guarantee part of it, and that's the power of the First Amendment. So this has been the, uh, the basically cr crux of what I do training and what others do training in, in the use in the, the role model that the First Amendment has and in the role models organizations like NPR and, and C-SPAN and, and PBS have in, in the world because we try to do certain things. I mean, sometimes you get in trouble for doing even that because you broadcast live uh, parliaments in some of the Arab countries without the government wanting because the executives want uh, to control uh, life and they don't want even their legislatures, which is often very close to the government, to actually have a say. Um, anyway, so uh, the, the First Amendment is very powerful and very important as a role model. 
So when uh, recently the change of, of government happened in the U.S. and you started hearing uh, statements from the White House that were very much anti-media, the question that came up to me and others is, what's happening, as you said, and is your question was, what's happening with the First Amendment? Is that being now eroded? Is the power of First Amendment, Amendment that you always talk about, is that now uh, under scrutiny because uh, a certain president doesn't like the media? And to be honest, for the first few weeks, uh, we were shaken up a lot. Thank God, in the last, you know, in the last two months, because of some really courageous investigative journalists in the U.S. and in the Times and Washington Post and others, uh, we've seen, uh, you know, people who are, you know, the L.A. Times did a series that are standing up to to President Trump and to that, and so there has been a kind of a, a, a counter reaction to many of, of my colleagues. are saying, "Wow, you know, there there does seem to be that the First Amendment is still." alive and kicking, and people do uh, see that it seems to work. It seems to, even a president uh, is not able to, to take away or to erode its power. And so it's still you know, very in, in flux. People are still not sure uh, how that is. But it's, uh, for many of us, the First Amendment is a huge kind of role model. Which brings me to a good point. Uh, and I thank you for bringing this up, is we do still, of course, in the United States, we have what we call the rule of law, uh, meaning that the laws apply to everyone, including the President of the United States. Uh, we also have it still an independent judiciary. So uh, as you know, even the chief of staff, whose quote I mentioned earlier, had to point out, we can't really change libel law unless we change the Constitution. And there's really no, doesn't seem to really be any enthusiasm for that outside of the White House. But this does also raise the point about uh, and I'm going to turn to Amy for this one, is how you explain that in um, parts of the world where that is not the norm necessarily. So talk, can you talk a little bit about how uh, you deal with your students, for example, about how you explain the First Amendment, the rule of law, and how all that works? Absolutely. So just to give you a little um, sort of context for where I teach, um, Northwestern University, uh, which is a renowned uh, journalism program in the United States, uh, opened a campus in Qatar uh, in the Middle East in 2008. So we teach um, the same curriculum that we would teach in the United States, uh, only I have the privilege of teaching students from more than 30 different countries. Uh, we're a very small program, we have about 300 students. Uh, and I've been in Qatar now for three years. In fact, I saw many of you last year when IPI was in Doha. Um, so the, the first year that I taught in Qatar, it was a very interesting experience. I'm um, American educated uh, and sort of took for granted a number of the things that Daoud and Tony have mentioned in the sense that um, I thought that my, my students would all understand rule of law. I thought that they would understand um, a constitutional protection for freedom of expression. Um, but as Daoud mentioned, uh, nearly every country in the Middle East actually has a constitutional protection uh, for freedom of expression. What differs is that limitation. And so we spend a lot of time um, in our classes talking about the fact that um, freedom of expression can exist in non-democratic societies and should exist in non-democratic societies. Uh, coming from a Western uh, educational background, um, I often grow frustrated with my colleagues who uh, say, well, you can never have freedom of expression if you don't have a democracy. Um, I think that's a really frightening idea in parts of the world that are not democratic to think that if we're not democratic, we can't have freedom of expression. So we talk about um, the role that freedom of expression has in making everyone an active member of society, whether or not you're in a democracy. Uh, we talk a lot about the value of rule of law and why rule of law is important. Um, because many of them uh, come from countries where uh, either an authoritarian or autocratic government decides when rule of law applies and when it doesn't. We talk about the value of having um, checks and balances, uh, of having a tripartite government structure where you have equal share of power between um, the executive, judiciary, and, and legislative functions. Um, but perhaps the most interesting thing uh, I don't want to say that, that what's happened in the United States has actually been helpful to me, but it has in my teaching. 
Um, because initially when I came to Qatar, students would say, my journalism students would say, well, we can never do the things that American journalism students could do because we don't have the First Amendment. It's, it's harder here. It's harder to do good journalism in Qatar. And I say to them now, you know, journalists in the United States are being arrested. Photographers are asking, being asked not to take photos. This is the condition of journalism in the world. And it's our responsibility as journalists to fight for the rights that we want to have. Uh, so in that way, seeing um, some of these challenges in the American system has actually, I think, emboldened my students to understand that they have to fight for freedom of expression, for freedom of the press, that someone's not just going to give that, that right to them. Uh, so that's actually been really helpful. And uh, you raise a good point, too, about the, uh, and both you and Daoud raise this point about the limitations in other uh, constitutional-like documents uh, that are not in the First Amendment. The First Amendment simply says the part that we care about, uh, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Now, the courts have read various limitations on that uh, into the First Amendment over the years in deciding cases, but the language itself doesn't have any limitations. That's not true of the European Convention, the American Convention, uh, which is mostly a Latin American uh, document. It's not true of the uh, African Union's uh, charter. Uh, all of them have, you know, that all of them have statements that say, as uh, the Jordanian uh, document says, that there is a limitation, that, that there is a limitation on the law. So that's the good news, I guess. Uh, the First Amendment is still around. Uh, the courts have not changed any interpretations of it. Um, journalism still goes on uh, in the United States. But this organization and others are, I think, right to raise the, the concern that the rhetoric that we're hearing from the President of the United States and his supporters is not helpful uh, elsewhere in the world where, where rights are more uh, fragile. Uh, where rights are more uh, in danger. And I wanted to ask, I'm actually going to ask everybody in the panel, starting with Daoud, if we could talk a little bit about the, what the rhetoric is actually doing or what we are worried that it might be doing. Yeah, the, um, in, in journalism as in life, uh, sometimes the perception is as important as the reality. And if the perception is one way or another, it, it does have a big effect. And there's something in journalism we call the chilling effect. And the chilling effect is when something is done to, you know, when you arrest a cadre or when you uh, close a newspaper, you're not only aiming at that particular journalist or that particular newspaper, you're aiming to send waves of intimidation to everybody else because you cannot stop every single newspaper and you cannot stop every journalist. And so what autocratic regimes do is they, they kind of focus in on a particular troublesome, in their point of view, a, a media outlet or a journalist, and they, they make a lesson out of them. And as a result, they, they hope that everybody will kind of fall in line. And often it works. It, in, in more times than one, the people who need a job uh, will not go against the system, especially in, in many countries where the, the media owners are either the government, semi-governmental agencies, or commercial companies in bed with government because they need the government for so many issues. And so uh, the, it's very quick that you will understand from your editor or from your publisher or your broadcaster that these are the red lines that have been created or they've been moved. And often you see that there is a changing of the goalposts and you don't know where the red lines are. And if you dare to challenge them, one of my uh, uh, investigative reporters last year uh, decided to do something in Jordan, it's a constitutional uh, law not to attack the king. And so this, this journalist was very creative. And so he went to the um, website of the king and he got a calculator and counted how many days the king was away from the country because by law, every time he leaves, he has to actually make a decree. And so he added them up and he came up with, I don't know, 20% of the year the king was away from the country. You know, he made five visits to the US, four visits to the UK, three visits to Egypt, whatever. He didn't make a commentary, he didn't say anything. He said, this is exactly what the website said. And he just published that. And they went crazy, you know, even though he did not really attack the king, he didn't say it was bad or good and whatever. 
and they kept on saying, change the headline, at least say that he was doing this on business of, of the state, not on entertainment and so on. So this is the kind of thing that you, sometimes you have you know, courageous journalists who push the envelope, but then once they get you know, you know, pointed out, then you know, they, they get disillusioned or they leave or they change their, their careers, and that chilling effect is what really worries me more than the actual reality. We actually have a really good example um, in Qatar. So Qatar, like many countries, um, has a licensing law. So the press and publications law in Qatar uh, dates to 1979 and has not been amended since then. Um, and the, the feistiest, I guess you would say, of the news outlets in Qatar was an online site called Doha News. Some of you may have actually seen it while you were there last year. Um, and in the fall, um, Doha News was uh, taken offline. Uh, and initially people were, were um, you know, cri there were cries of censorship and other things and the government was quiet for a while um, about why Doha News was um, blocked. Uh, eventually it came out that um, from the government, uh, the explanation for blocking Doha News um, an online only site was that it was not um, properly licensed under a law from 1979, uh, which if you read says absolutely nothing about websites. Uh, and so, you know, as an attorney, I, I read the law, I teach the law to my students. Um, and, and part of the problem in many parts of the world is that these laws can be interpreted in, in the way that's favorable to the government. Um, and, and to this day, uh, Doha News has not been unblocked uh, in, in Qatar and is, has basically had significantly diminished reporting capabilities. The uh, two founders are back in the United States. They're not in Qatar anymore. Um, and quite frankly, uh, I would suspect a number of people are, are nervous in country to report for Doha News. Um, given the situation, and so all of that is a prime example of the chilling effect in action. Uh, the other publications uh, in the country, the other English language print publications in the country, have largely returned to publishing government news releases uh, and have stepped away from doing uh, independent journalism, uh, in part because of, of a concern of, of what's going to happen if they do. Well, we know that uh, recently we, uh, there was an uproar in Thailand when a, a media outlet uh, ran a photo of what appeared to be the, uh, the leader of Thailand, the prime minister, I believe, uh, walking in a tank top through a mall uh, with a, another woman, and it was considered an outrage that they would show the, uh, that person dressed that way. In the United States, meanwhile, we recently had a, uh, one of the satirical shows did a rather lengthy piece on how fat Donald Trump is. Um, and he basically just has to take that, although he doesn't take it well. Uh, but at the same time, and I do, I, I, you know, I can make light to some extent. We have the, the luxury, I think, of making light to some extent of our president uh, exploding over things that uh, he has no control over. But uh, again, I want to get back to this question. I do worry about the message that he is sending to other parts of the world. Uh, I found it rather disturbing that he gave a speech to the uh, graduating Coast Guard Academy class uh, a few days ago in which he basically whined about the media while sending these young men off to, uh, to defend their country. It's a little uh, off-putting to, uh, to hear that, uh, that particular type of speech. Um, and it does kind of make me wonder, what, again, what kind of message we're sending to people who already uh, are happy to find any excuse they can find to, to go after the media. Ashley, I know uh, your focus is pretty much close to home, but I wonder if you've uh, talked to anybody about whether Donald Trump's words are having an effect elsewhere, including maybe on some of your own reporters. Uh, we do have journalists all over the world, and so I am conscientious of the laws in other countries and what, are, what would be expected of us and, and how the journalists <laughs> behave. Um, you know, it's a really hard question to answer because I, I would like to think that the United States has been a model for press freedom. I, I mean, I would like to believe that. <laughs> I don't know that it's always been true. I don't know that 
um, other countries have chosen to follow our model because they necessarily think it's a good one. In fact, I often go to conferences where uh, media lawyers from other countries criticize our model. They criticize the actual malice rule. They criticize New York Times versus Sullivan. They criticize many things about our system. And, and I appreciate that. Every country's law is based on philosophies that undergird their system and, and the culture, and so you're going to have different outcomes in different countries depending on the underlying philosophies that they adhere to. But I would like to think that at least as a model of, of um, from a practical standpoint, the fact that journalists can and do gather news about government entities and do report freely has shown that it's, it's, a, it's possible that you can, you can do it and that society can can be productive and survive and that it's a good thing overall for the community. And I think that still continues to be true. You know, it's funny, as much as people talk about how much Donald Trump complains about the press, it's not like we've had a dearth of reporting in the United States. Um, in fact, I think most American journalists feel reinvigorated. The New York Times and the Washington Post are doing quite a bit of journalism. They're publishing stories regularly about uh, things that, that Donald Trump probably wouldn't want us to publish. There are leaks everywhere in Washington, <laughs> D.C. Um, there are stories about the leaks in addition to the stories from the leaks. I mean, that's, that's what the situation is like right now. So it's not as if anybody appears to actually have been um, chilled in any meaningful way, at least in the United States. But what message does that send? You know, it's an interesting question. I don't know. The fact that our journalists are still doing what they do despite the rhetoric um, I, I don't know. I don't know how people in other countries perceive that. I would like to think that it shows the. Um, re thank you. That's the word I was looking for. The resilience of our system and the ability of Americans to uh, to engage in self-government. Because really, at its core, the the way our constitution is set up, it does not establish an entity. There's nothing in the Constitution that says we're creating a government and that government is a static entity that will be in charge of everything. It doesn't say that. What it sets out is a process, a process of self-government by people for people and people are engaged and the press is a part of that system. And so it explains a process by which people uh, elect certain officials to serve the public and it explains how the press is going to be free to do what it does so that those people can be held accountable to the public because our system is for the public. And I think if anything, what has been happening in the last several months shows how that works. Uh, what will happen in the future, I don't know, but I, I think that if you consider our system to be a model of, uh, of a process, of a, a process of self-government, that, that we are still up upholding that model, at least the journalists are. Um, I have no comment on what government officials are doing, but I will say that journalists are continuing to do what journalists are expected to do. Good to know. Um, and uh, I feel better already. I don't know about everybody else. But, <laughs> but I think that it might be uh, useful to find out what everybody else is thinking. So uh, at this point, I'd like to turn this over for questions. Um, yes. My question is for Amy. Um, I lived in Saudi Arabia for four years and uh, I did some journalism courses for women journalists over there. This is about 10 years ago. And I wanted to ask you, is there still a perception that freedom of expression, like women's rights, is part of some kind of a Western agenda? Um, so I will preface this by saying the first thing that I learned um, moving to Qatar is that the Middle East is a rich and diverse place. So I, I want to be clear that this is based on my experience in Qatar, um, and, and I don't want I don't want this to be translated into all of the Middle East. Um, although I've visited nearly every country, save Saudi, um, my and my students come from a number of them. I think that the connection is particularly in Qatar very strong between the danger between freedom of expression and the critique and overthrow of government. Um, I think that there is um, a belief that freedom of expression and a stable community, a stable society cannot exist. 
that if we allow everyone to say what they're thinking and speak their minds, that we're going to, we're going to have chaos. Um, and so I, I think the concern that we hear frequently in Qatar is, you know, everyone's happy and, and we get along and the country is stable and prosperous and economically we're headed in the right direction and we're bringing in educational opportunities. And certainly there's very little fear of the West in that regard in Qatar. There are six American universities and three or four European universities operating campuses there. So it's not um, an anti-Western sentiment so much as it is, I think, an anti-democratic sentiment. Um, I just want to add to that. Um, it's interesting you're hearing all that from a professor in Qatar, which is the home of Al Jazeera. Nobody's mentioned the Al Jazeera, which is a fabulous uh, broadcaster about everything in the Arab world except Qatar. So um, I remember in 1996, I created in Palestine a website called Amin Arabic Media Internet Network. And I, I received the first grant on a simple idea. I said to uh, the Open Society people, I said, you know, if you want to learn about Syria, uh, read Lebanese newspapers. If you want to learn about Algeria, read the Moroccan newspapers. If you want to read about Egypt. So in the Arab world, each country right, is really great about everything except that particular country. And so I created a website where I put the news about all the Arab countries on the same website, and you can really find out what was happening. And so this is one of the problems we have, is that external news is much uh, freer than internal news, and you need to know what's happening in your country, you have to read somebody else's in your own language. But, uh, and of course, with the internet now, that has made uh, attempts like closing down Doha news a joke because you can do uh, everything else outside of Doha and everything is being now um, passed around on Facebook, on Instagram, on, on Twitter, on uh, uh, everything else. So uh, the, the fact is that um, attempts to confine things uh, are failing, but I think the idea that um, human rights or, or press freedoms is a Western idea is used by politicians when they're, they're not happy with a particular issue. They, they love the media when it's kind of like Trump, when it's about good about them, but when it's against them, all of a sudden they don't like it. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you to the panel. Ken McQuarrie is my name, BBC, and um, uh, also a Scot. Um, I uh, just want to say thank you for a very thought-provoking and interesting discussion. And I'm happy, Anthony, if you rule my contribution as off-topic. Uh, but um, I just wanted to ask, you said, uh, Anthony, that the bit that we care about in terms of the First Amendment but I just wanted to ask, to what extent are American politics that we're seeing today uh, a result of the media in, in using its freedom, not providing the public square to uh, allow the, set, the petition, the sense of grievance from various communities across the UK, be it the black community post-Vietnam, be it um, people who either are or have perceived themselves as economically disadvantaged by the federalism of the states and to what extent has the media uh, used its freedom uh, even handedly uh, in in, on that part of the First Amendment. As I say, I'm happy for you to rule it off topic. Wow, okay. Um, how much time do we have? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Notice everyone else is looking at me at this point. Um, I think you, you raise an interest, a, a really good point that with freedom, of course, as we all know, freedom with freedom comes responsibility. And do the media use their responsibility as well as they should at all times? Probably not. Uh, I would point out that since, as particularly since the uh, internet has become popular, um, I think we sometimes think, well, if we're not getting to everything, if we're not reflecting every possible uh, reality, it's okay, there are communities on the internet that will do that, and I think that's lazy, to be honest. Um, I think if, if something isn't reflected in the mainstream media, it oftentimes is easier to ignore, and I think uh, the media, are, I think 
many people in the media are coming to the realization that we didn't pay enough attention to uh, many communities that, that had things, worries and things to say that we weren't paying attention to, uh, that, that weren't adequately being addressed. Um, I think, it, uh, unfortunately, it sometimes takes something like an unexpected election outcome, and most people did not expect this election outcome. Uh, it takes an unexpected election outcome, I think, sometimes to get people to re revisit uh, things that they could have done to better. And I don't think anybody is purposely saying, let's ignore all poor white people, uh, you know, or we don't care about the working class white people. Um, I think what has been more the case is uh, that the media sometimes follow the loudest voices and there hadn't, there's been a lot of quiet despair, I think, in many communities, including the one I come from. I I'm originally from Eastern Kentucky. Um, I go back to visit occasionally and I've been hearing the drumbeat of things are horrible for a while. Uh, I, to be honest with you, um, attributed some of that to the fact that there was an African American in the White House and a lot of pe people I was visiting were not terribly racially sophisticated. So I think I thought their perception was things were bad because Barack Obama had been elected and they didn't think uh, that was something that should happen in, in what they considered white America. Uh, what I become, have come to realize is that I, I grossly misunderstood what was go going on, and I'm from there. <laughs> I should know better. So I think a lot of people who should have known better didn't, and I hope this uh, period in our history is a, an awakening that we should pay more attention to people who are not jumping up and down and screaming to get our attention. Anyone else want to? Uh, Marty Steffens from the University of Missouri. Uh, one of the things that we haven't really talked about is the, uh, the Trump egging on people to attack the press. And we're seeing that in rope tree journalists, uh, the t-shirts being worn, um, uh, and also trolling uh, journalists on the internet. Uh, Charlie Gasparino, who is actually a conservative, is a bit of conservative, works for Fox News, uh, has really been trolled terribly by the far right and the left. Uh, can't say anything, and you know, and being an independent. Uh, so I really, you know, outside of the bubble, uh, no offense, Ashley, but but I think there's a bubble on the West Coast and the East Coast. Um, but I think that there is a lot of very negative things saying about journalists in the middle. Um, Anthony and I, and, and Rochelle, and 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 others, and. Uh, Amy, you know, where Northwestern is in Chicago, we're seeing a lot of very negativism that's causing self-censorship. Uh, when you threaten journalists, uh, perhaps with uh, uh, legal action if they print leaks, um, uh, witch hunts, that kind of thing, I think that there's a lot of uh, societal pressure, trolls on the internet, as well as self-censorship that's going on. That's not, that despite the very brave truth-telling of the, the New York Times and the Washington Post and the LA Times that w perhaps we're seeing a real retrenchment in the middle where a lot of the Trump supporters, uh, you know, are. I agree with that. Um, and when people ask me what worries me, you know, it's the things I can't control that worry me. If somebody sues us, I, I know, I, I know libel and privacy law very well. I know copyright law very well. I know the, the First Amendment principles very well. I know how to defend a lawsuit. That is something that I can manage. I can't always control the outcomes, but at least I can make educated guesses about how it's going to go. Um, I can, I know FCC regulations, FTC regulations well enough to make educated guesses about what we can realistically do to, uh, what, what would incur government wrath and what wouldn't. The things I can't control, are things like journalists being attacked, not by government officials, but by other people. But I've always worried about that. Um, like I said, we have journalists all over the world. We have journalists in places where um, they get, where journalists get killed. And journalist safety is something that I worry about a lot and it's not something that the law can fix. I'm a lawyer, I can work with the law. I can't work with individual decisions by people who are going to act out, and it, it is frightening, and it is disturbing, um, but it's also something outside the scope of what I can realistically do anything about, um, other than a lot of praying. <laughs> um, 
Well, and I, I think that media organizations are realizing that maybe they've taken for granted for a long time that people do see the value of, of what the press provides. And so there is a lot of reflection about how do we show our credibility? How do we show the value of our work? How do we demonstrate that people do in fact need us to do our jobs? The interesting thing is that most people love their local media. They'll say that they hate the media, but when you ask them, do you like your local station? They usually do. And so while there is a lot of rhetoric and there are people who uh, are saying and doing things that are, are frightening. I think that overall uh, there is a, a perception that the media is valuable. Um, and, and they may love some media and not like others. For example, uh, people may love Fox News but hate CNN or vice versa. It's not that they hate the media. They just get irritated with certain ones. And, and that's okay. People are allowed to have different opinions about you know, how they, they take in their news and information. So the job, I think, is to, to prove through our actions the value of what we do and to, uh, maybe, maybe I'm overconfident. I do think truth proves itself um, and that it, it will come out in the long run that uh, the work that's being done is valuable and that people will see that. I also think um, that I have a lot of these conversations with my students. And I think that um, there are two things that we don't necessarily teach enough of in journalism education. Um, the first is the value of civic courage um, and the notion that it, journalism is dangerous work. And particularly in the United States and to some extent in the Middle East, um, I think we hide the fact of that because it's not sexy. It doesn't, it doesn't encourage moms and dads to send their sons and daughters out to be journalists. Um, and I think we have to own it. I think we have to talk about the responsibility that the press plays in society. But I also think we have to give students and young journalists the tools they need to be as safe as they can. We don't teach risk assessment in American journalism schools. We don't teach safety and security. We're behind the curve teaching about cybersecurity and protecting your data and what to do when you cross borders between countries. Um, because journalism has always been risky. It's about minimizing risk. And we don't do enough with young journalists, we don't do enough with, with students to talk about those very touchy, delicate, sensitive subjects. Um, and, and so I think, I think, yes, journalists are being threatened and attacked. Um, and I think we've lived in a very sheltered environment in the United States for a long time, not having to deal with what journalists around the world have to deal with. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of an educational gap that we need to start addressing with young professionals and with students. I, I would agree with that. And I think from a professional standpoint, we do train journalists to be careful with information security and personal safety and all those issues. But they don't get it in school. And, and there's a big, big gap between what's expected professionally and what the universities teach. And that's something we have to deal with. Um, another area that uh, we haven't talked about is the foreign policy of the U.S. And uh, the statements made, I mean, we always knew that national interest sometimes trumps human rights. But there was always a kind of a, an accepted level that the U.S. would stand up for. And now we are seeing that basically all that, I mean, the first country that the president of the U.S. is visiting is Saudi Arabia. I mean, not a very high level country on, on, on human rights is the sign that these issues are no longer important from the American foreign policy. And, and, and the Secretary of State actually said, it's no longer going to be the human rights issue is, is high on our agenda. So that in itself is, is also scary, that the journalists who risk their lives in, in foreign countries would hope that at least there would be a statement or somebody would do would say something if you get arrested or get uh, in a violation. Uh, that, we cannot count on that anymore, that Americans would stand up for freedom of express around the world. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, I see you. Oh, no. Uh, uh, OK, tell you what, go ahead. It's a short one. Thank you so much. I'm Rochelle Riley from the Detroit Free Press. And my question was a follow to Marty's. I was horrified when Facebook wanted to come up with an algorithm to help people spot fake news. Uh, it was uh, infuriating and made me think that they think everybody is dumb. 
Um, and I was glad to hear uh, Ashley talk about the fact that there is no agency um, for doing this because our Constitution is a process and not a finite enforcement agency. But whose responsibility is it to step up to make sure that people are understanding not just the role of media, but what media is? Is it something that should be in high school? Is it, uh, Amy, something that should be a part of, co because it's not just the role of journalists. I mean, if you're trying to teach everybody what media is, you can't just do it in journalism school, but that's the problem we face. I'm a columnist who has to explain every day the difference between columns and news stories. So that was my question, thank you. Amy and I are going to have dueling uh, microphones here. But, um, okay. I'm just going to mention real quick, you mentioned should we start in high school. I would argue you should start in, in elementary school. Uh, I think there needs to be media, media literacy throughout the system. Um, and I don't know why we're not there yet. I mean, I, I thought that was obvious a long time ago, but we haven't quite gotten there. Absolutely. I think um, one, of the, one of the most difficult things, um, and I think it's part of, of talking about uh, you know, civics and, and being a member in your society, whether that means you live in a democracy and you get to vote or you don't, that um, media literacy and understanding in the value of information. Um, you know, we always talk about living in the information age, but we certainly don't address it in schools, right? We don't talk to students about what is truthful information, how do you get information. I remember as a young child, um, going to the library and, and having the librarian talk about books as a source of information. Now we just sort of assume that because everything's on the internet, everyone knows how to use it as a source of information. Um, I just recently worked with um, Qatar's regulatory, uh, communications regulatory authority to talk about how do we teach social media ethics to you know, elementary school children because they're on social media. And I think, I think what that means is we have to teach parents and we have to teach kids from the moment they start to pick up these devices, how do we learn what's true? How do we learn what's credible? Um, it can't be when they get to my university, I start teaching them that. It's too late at that point. Thank you. And thank you. And thank all of you. Um, thank you, our panel, by the way, before I forget.